everybody asks me this, if you were your younger self or younger athletes, what would you tell them? I'm like, invest your money, invest it in things you know, invest it in companies that you believe in. Today I'm chatting with Demetrius Johnson, uh, AKA Mighty Mouse. Demetrius was the first 125 pound champion over at UFC then defended his belt 11 times. That's more fingers than I got. I was going to put up the fingers. <laughs> <laughs> I got enough fingers, bro. So 12-time champion, 12-time champion at UFC. Uh, later went over to one champion with my homie Rich Franklin. And um, you, you won the a Grand Prix tournament over there. That's, yep. that's a, a different type of championship, yeah? Yep, it's, uh, it's based and modeled off the old Pride days where they had, you know, Pride Critical Countdown, the Pride World Grand Prix. And you basically have, you know, 16-man or 8-man bracket. You work your way through it. And back in the day in Pride, they would have the athletes who fight for the championship fight two times a night. So, you, you know, semi, semi will fight once and once at the very beginning of the card. And then the main event will be the winner of those two fights will fight mm -hmm. for the championship. So I just won that one over in 2019. I won that one. Uh, over there, forgive me, I, I know about one, I know a couple of the people over <laughs> there, but um, I know Gary Tonin, I know yep. Rich Franklin, I feel like I know somebody else that I'm not thinking about, for, forgive me. Um, but I, don't under, I know they do some really unique things over there. They have some like special rules fights. That yep. I think you just had one of those against the, the Muay Thai guy. Or, yes, uh, broad thing. So, yeah, one championship is a little bit different than the UFC or PFL, Bellator, LFA, all of them over here in the States they like to celebrate martial arts in general. Mm -hmm. So you have mixed martial arts, kickboxing, Muay Thai. Now they have submission wrestling. They even have boxing fights. Mm -hmm. And we just did a special rules fight where I fought Rod Tank. One round was Muay Thai, one round was mixed martial arts. Third back to Muay Thai, fourth back to mixed martial arts. So they kind of just do their own thing and celebrate mixed martial arts in general over there. Now, you know, when I, I seen that, uh, your fight with him, when I, I saw the, the, that, First round this, second round that. I'm like, man, that that's a lot of discipline and thinking <laughs> when you're, you know, in the mix of, you, know, you got a mild concussion or something. You got, oh, I can't do that this well, round, but next round I can. Well, the hardest thing I tell people is that I spent my whole career, you know, doing mixed martial arts, right? So when I would fight, it's based off mixed martial arts. I'm only focused on like when I hip, when I throw my right hand, how does it set me up for a, a shot or how does it set up my left kick? or has to set me up getting into the clinch. So the first one was like, you can't clinch the way you do in mixed martial arts. Mm -hmm. You can't shoot, you can't grapple, you can't do nothing. It's just straight stand up in Muay Thai. And I was like, uh, this is gonna be a pickle. But it was fun, it was a good experience and I'm glad I did it. Oh, well, you won, you got a yeah. uh, choking submission, yeah? Yep, yep, one won it. It was, a, it, was a good, it was a good risk to take, right? Just because Rod Ting is such a superstar over in Thailand. And a lot of people say that it was a good fight because you have the Muay Thai fans come and watch mixed martial arts. And you have the mixed martial arts fans get introduced to hmm. one of the best power uh, Muay Thai fighters in the world. So we won big, we won, and I'm happy I'm healthy and get ready for the next one. You know, you know something that I love asking when I have somebody that uh, is, is one of a champion at anything. And mm -hmm. I had a lot of people that won, you know, they won a Super Bowl, they won a this or that, they won an Olympic medal. And those are extraordinary accomplishments. But you're, you're a 12-time champion at UFC, and then you, you move over to you know, another major organization. Some people don't, you know, one, one champion is huge in Asia, yeah? Oh, but, it's, it's massive, yeah. and it, they just signed a deal with uh, Amazon to start streaming on Amazon Prime. So some people from North America that, that might not be familiar, the, this one champion's a, a big, big deal in the, in the Asian audience. Um, has a lot of eyeballs on it, gets a lot of attention. So um, I didn't hear about it, you know, early on. I've, I've only learned about it in recent years. Mm -hmm. But this is, you know, a big operation, and you're some of the most talented people in the world there, including yourself. And you're over there beating them and getting the championship there as well. And then you have another fight coming up yeah. right around the corner here. Yeah, so one is is the biggest sports uh, media property over in Asia. Um, it's, it's getting a lot of eyeballs because you know, Asia is massive and it has, the dem not demographic, but just the, the population count over in India, Thailand, China, Japan. It's just, you know, through the roof. And so, you know, when I made the opportunity, when I made the choice to go over there to compete in one championship, it was the opportunity. Like when you were speaking earlier about uh, the values, that if you share the values and the same morals as a person or a company, you guys have a good relationship. So, so far it's been amazing. 
Now getting ready to fight Adrian Marais at One Chip Shoot 161 on Amazon Prime. It's the first Prime uh, live streaming event, so I'm super excited about it. And yeah, they have you know the best athletes in the world because you, you got so many different uh, disciplines of, of martial arts itself under one umbrella. I, I was uh, I got distracted, but I was going to say that you. are you're not just you. Know, you didn't just win a Super Bowl one time, and you were on, you were on the team, <laughs> or you didn't just win a, an Olympic medal one time, which is an extraordinary feat. But mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you didn't just do that one time, and you got your medal. You're you know 13, 14 time world champion. Yeah. And um, you know the, there's got to be a different psychology that goes look to, to have those type of results. A guy's got to be thinking a bit different and behaving a bit different. That if you were doing normal people things, there's no way you'd have such extraordinary outcomes. It, yeah, man. You know, and I think about like when you put it in that that context of you know, you know, Tom Brady wins multiple you know Super Bowls with the same team, then he goes to you know the Tampa Bay Buccaneers wins it again. And for me, when I look back at like my time as a, a world champion and get defending the belt over and over again, I would say I had a great group of training partners around me, great group of coach, um, a very small circle, uh, family and friends around me. And it was just consistent. And for me, my coach told me is that I view my training as a job. You know, I show up to the gym, okay, what are we doing? What do we need to get done? And I'll put the work in. And when I go home, I'll be extremely disciplined, eat the right foods, want to go out and party, want to do drugs. And I think just that overall consistency in the gym and that same lifestyle at home helped me get to that 11 or 12 consecutive, you know, World Championships, and for that long period of time in the, U in the UFC, that's six years from 2012 to I believe 2018, that I was very consistent to being a champion, was that just that, that focus of, and also having a chip on my shoulder, to be honest with you, having a chip on my shoulder, you know, not making the money that I think I deserve, was deserve, deserved to make, um, seeing other athletes who weren't even a world champion make more money, more money than me, just because they're bigger or have a bigger name, uh, so I think a combination of all that stuff kind of gave me that, that motivation to, to, to clear, not clarify, but just to get that 12 time, uh, world title. I, I want to talk about that chip on your shoulder and, and some <laughs> of that negative motivation, but I, I want to highlight to them just one moment first that, you know, if, and to correct me if I'm wrong, yeah. but, uh, I'm not a true, uh, UFC fan in the sense that I know all the stats. Yeah. I know a lot of the people and I know their story and I'm yeah. friends and train with many of them, but. Um, Anderson Silva, I believe he defended his belt 10 times. Did you, yes. you I, I think yes, that you have, right. you have right. more title defenses than anyone else in UFC history, is yeah. that correct? So, so how it breaks down is that Anderson Silva has 10 consecutive title defenses. I have 11. John Jones has the most world title uh, victories. I think he's at 14. But, I didn't think but after. a choppy road. But a choppy road, you know. Yeah. Pico Grams gets stripped and all that stuff, but as far as like consecutive, like back to back on the scale, making weight, no controversy, no issues, no, you know, failed drug testing like that, I have the most, I, I think, in the world of mixed martial arts. I think the next person who's close to me is Bibiana Fernandez, and I think he had nine consecutive title defenses over in one championship. So, yeah, I mean, 11 times consecu consecutive, consistency, making weight, no controversy, no failed drug test, no missed drug test. I think I got that, that, and that there's record. A, a lot of people, you know, Joe Rogan, Daniel Cormier, talk about you as being, you know, the, like the best pound for pound, uh, you know, martial arts fighter ever. Mm -hmm. And, you know, th 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 these, I'm just making the, accentuating to them for somebody that doesn't know that, you know, like, oh, it's, you know, Derek's had another UFC champion on his YouTube. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, but. <laughs> You know, many people think you know the best pound for pound fighter ever ever so there's an extraordinary talent and extraordinary dedication but let's go back to that chip on your shoulder yeah yeah so i i grew up this way with um you know i i, I mentioned this to you off camera that i, I really i sufficiently disliked my childhood mm -hmm. that I, I had a thought in my head and you'll understand it some people don't but i had a thought in my head that like i don't give a fuck what i have to do I'm going to do whatever it takes for however long it takes to get far away from here, you know, from, yeah. from that circumstance. And, um, you know, that wasn't, if I, if I look back on that, you know, now I'm 43, 
when I look back at that, you know, when I start having things like thoughts like that in my head, you know, more than 30 years ago, yep. is that the healthiest thought for a young person to have? Well, that's debatable, yeah. but it helped me get results. Yep. And that's not debatable. That should help me get results. And it probably wasn't until my 30s, and you know, we, you know, I, I blush a little bit because, um, you know, if I knew better earlier, I would have done better earlier. But I was probably, you know, 30, 32, when, you know, I started using a little less negative self-talk and a little less, you know. I'll say, you know, negative motivation. Yeah. And I start thinking to myself, you know, a, a, a real click in my head is like, in my, <laughs> this is really how I thought about it. In my own internal words, I was like, you know, hey, asshole, you got a, a long history. You know you're going to do the thing. If you set a goal, I know I'm going to do the thing. Yep. I know I'm going to wake up. I don't give a shit what kind of mood I'm in. I don't care if I got a little headache or my tummy hurts or mm -hmm. I only slept three hours. That, well, yeah, but it's time to do the thing you're supposed to do, you know? Yep. And, you know, I made myself do that from, you know, sort of a, with a, a negative thought process for a lot of years. And it's, you know, around age 30, I was like, hey, you know you're going to do the thing. Yep. And I, I started to trust myself that you're going to do the thing. Why don't you get yourself in the best mood that you could be in? Why don't you allow yourself to be in the, you know, the happiest, best, most positive mood you could be in, so long as it doesn't affect your results, so yeah. long as you're still doing the thing, be in the best mood you could. And you know, just be resigned. Yeah, I'm going to do what I'm supposed to do today. But I'm going to be fucking happy while I do it. Mm -hmm. And if I'm not happy, I'm going to do it anyway. But yep. I might as well be as happy as I can. You yeah. Know? So as long, as long as you don't start lying to yourself or start letting the results slip. And that, that was a big one for me. That, that really, that shift in psychology, it gave me a bit more energy, gave me a little more oomph that I could do even more. Mm -hmm. Then I was happy. And, and then I felt stupid. I'm like, well, why didn't you do that 15, 20 years ago? <laughs> But I didn't have that model then. Yeah. But what was it like for you? Yeah, I think you hit on a nail. I think if everybody in the whole world, whether it's successful or not, if they don't know what they know in 15 years prior, before, you know, if I if I've told myself like, damn, you know, if I were to start investing in fucking Apple, <laughs> right when I jumped it, right when I turned, you know, 19 and I got my first check, I wouldn't be fighting right now, right? Because, you know, that's just something you know, you learn as you develop. And I think for me, you know, having a, a rough childhood and thinking back, like, you know, there'll be times where I was like, I, I never want to go back to that, right? Like I told myself now, like, I never want to go back to a nine to five job because, you know, even though that was kind of my upbringing, I never want to go back there. You know, even I tell myself, if I desperately have to go back to work a nine to five job, let's say, you know, my next fight, I go out, I blow my knee out and, you know, three years, I just, I don't recover the same and I don't, you know, I'm not making this, the same money, fine, I'll have to go back to a nine to five job. But as of right now, while I'm healthy, I'm doing everything in my, you know, physical, physical well-being that I'm not going back there, right? Because I don't, you know, I've experienced that. And, you know, like you said, I'm going to do whatever the fuck I have to so I don't have to, you know, go back to that. I want to get as far away from there as possible. So for me, I think that was a little bit of a chip on my shoulder. Um, seeing other athletes get opportunities that I didn't get the opportunity to, to do, even though I was more successful than they are. And, you know, and three is just you want to give a better life for your future, which are my children. So that's how I view that growing up. It's, it's a good point you make that everybody wishes you, you, know, you could go back 15 years and I should have bought this or I should have done that. Could you, ima could you imagine how, could you imagine it's like, oh, man. If you would have just done something t different, like if you'd have known this company was going to be what it is today, right? Like if yeah. you, that is just, you know, I, I tell I tell myself that all the time. Like when everybody asks me goes, if you were, were your younger self or younger athletes, what would you tell them? I'm like invest your money, invest it in things you know, invest it in companies that you believe in, and. I spent my life thinking about business the way that you spent your life thinking about MMA. And I made my first entrepreneurial money when I was seven. And you, you must have been, you weren't born yet. <laughs> seven? Uh, yeah, you're probably right, yeah. Yeah, I'm 43, so yep. you would have been uh, not quite born yet. Yeah. I feel like, uh, you know, there's a lot of ways to go get some money. There's a lot of ways to accomplish those goals. Mm -hmm. But if I had... If I had the knowledge that I currently have, you know, playing, playing that little fantasy game, mm -hmm. which I don't spend much time thinking about fantasy, but I, I admit to having this one on, on occasion. When I do have a fantasy three times a year, I think, well, if I had the current information, with, no, with nothing written down, with nothing else, yep. if I just had the information that's in my head, mm -hmm. and you could rewind the clock and go back to, say, the 2008 era before yeah. that recession, yeah. and I could short this and be long that, and da-da-da-da-da-da, and um, I, I would 
and not even a joke, I've done the math, I'd be the world's first trillionaire. With, wow. With no additional information, would just... Which is probably... You know, that. Yeah. And then, then imagine for, you know, imagine how your sports evolved over time that, you know, you wouldn't, you wouldn't only be a 14-time champion, you two. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know I, what else you would have accomplished that you didn't already accomplish, but it would have been even more if you had, if you had your current skill set, skill set back and other people de- were a decade behind you in skill set. Yeah, that's, even more absurdly, you know. Yeah, that's just the crazy thing about knowledge and over time, like you said, in business, the first you know trillionaire. Um, who knows what I could accomplish with the skill set I have now if I would have told myself, hey, they're gonna start kicking people in the fucking cap, so you start doing do it now. Don't worry about the thigh kicked in. I mean, you could do seminars. I mean, it's this endless amount of things you could have done with the knowledge we have today if we would have had, you know, back, you know, in 2008 or I started training in 2005. So 2006 for me, it would just be night and day difference. I'm curious. I want to delve a little deeper on the the topic that we were talking about, kind of, you know, positive or yep. positive, negative mindsets or that, that interplay. And I think both can be legitimate motivators and both yep. have been very useful to me at different times. And, you know, I, I, some people is you know, Derek, what's important is you're happy. You'll be dead soon, Derek. Be happy. Be happy. Well, you know, I, I don't know a, a whole lot of happy people that are broke. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> not, you know, does money buy happiness? Oh. Yes, it does. Yeah. Yes, it does. Money buys you the freedom to, to have safety and luxury for your family. Yep. Safety and luxury for yourself. Um, gives you the freedom to spend your time how you'd want to. That You, you don't have that time if you're yep. spending... You know, 40 hours or more at a job, plus commuting back and forth, yep. plus having that stuff way on your head in the background for the rest of your week. Yes, money does buy fucking happiness. And anybody that doesn't, anybody that disagrees with that, they don't know where to shop. They, they're not very creative in how to spend <laughs> their time either. But to my main point is, um, you know, if you if you front load the work, I didn't care what kind of mood I was in. I don't, mm-hmm. I don't. I value my goals more than I value my short-term emotions. Yeah. So, and I'm sure you do, you know? And I'm sure you say it's some things, you'd have some similar thoughts and some different thoughts. I'm, I'm curious to hear your perspective. Um, but I, I always think about long-term goals or, you know, how, how, are, how are my behaviors going to impact, you know, the course of my life? Yep. And, I, you know, for my short-term emotions, if we listen to our short-term emotions, nobody would do anything, you know? Yeah. Because so every day I don't feel like doing something. And then I, I laugh at myself. I said, well, the success gods, they don't care what I feel like right now. Yeah. The success gods don't care about my feelings. Yeah. But they do care about my behavior. Yeah. And if I behave well, if I, if I engage in the right behaviors, I tend to be rewarded with great outcomes. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So I've always had a focus on that. And, and I say it in like a cheery, you know, almost joking way, but also with a, a seriousness in my head that like, well, the money gods don't care how I feel. Yeah. The success gods, they don't care how I feel, but they will reward good behavior. So... Earlier on, I, I didn't have that cheeriness. It was a lot more like, you know, I had this, I had this model in my head, which is very cruel, but you know, way more than ten thousand times, I would, I would say to myself, you know, are you behaving like a champ or a chump right now? Mm-hmm. Meaning, are, are you engaging in a behavior that would lead to a, you know, a high-level champion-type outcome, or are you engaging in just some, you know, mediocre fiftieth percentile, you know, average-type outcome behavior? And I use that as a, you know, it's, it's a false dichotomy, but I, it was a very good motivational tool to be like, well, you only slept three hours, but what's, what's the optimal behavior you'd engage in right now to have the type of outcomes that you want? Yeah. All right, get up and let's go do that. You know? Yeah, and I think we said front-loading it, right? Front-loading all the work. That kind of hit me uh, really hard because, you know, at the time, you know, I would work, uh, there was a point in time when I was an amateur and I would have two jobs and I remember working at uh, Red Lobster, and then I was getting ready to transition into working, being assistant manager, m- manager at Journeys, while also training full time. And right there, I'm just front loading everything. I just, you know, I got insurance, I got a, a, a rental, uh, rent to pay, and I'm also trying to get my degree, an AA degree. So I was just front loading everything, right? To where a lot of people are like, I'm not gonna do all that stuff, I'm not happy, I don't get time to spend with my friends. I mean, at the time, me and my, my she's my wife now, but my girlfriend at the time, it, we didn't even see each other. It was like, she would work at Red Lobster, she would go and close the rest, open a restaurant and close it. I would wake up, go to school, go home, train, go to my first job at Red Lobster, get out there to go to Journey. So I'm just front loaded, no time for family or anything like that, but, I just wanted, you know, to get to a place far away from where I grew up from, right? Not to be able to grow up with no money, not having a car, 
always living paycheck to paycheck, right? I remember my mom saying, well, we made it this month, right? Child support came in, we made it this month. So for me, I was always want to get away from there as far as possible. So front loading, when you said that, I was like, that struck a nerve. And then right when I got to the point where I had to, you know, balance, I had to get rid of one of them because I was failing in school and I wasn't getting enough sleep. So I was like, well, school, I'm going to school because everybody says in order for you to be successful, you got to go to school, you got to go to college. So I was like, I'm done with that. So I was focused on my two jobs, training full time. And eventually I started to see results, right? I started to see results when I was winning my fights. And I was like, okay, well, now I only need one job. So that way I can make more money in this job, being an assistant manager at Journeys and working full time. But then still front loading, and then I was starting to see results, but then I was not getting the results I wanted financially because as an amateur, you don't make money. So I left that job and started working construction. And once I started doing that, I was starting to get more money financially, you know, because you're building buildings, creating scaffolding, just but it's a lot of hard labor, right? So then I started to see my training go down, right? So I'm still, I'm still trying to work and front load everything to get myself to be successful, but I started to see no results here. So I was like, you know what? What do I really want to see results in? Is it my training or do I care to have a lot more money right now? I was like, I want to see my training get better. So I quit that job and took a, a, a huge massive pay cut and went to work in a warehouse called Carestar where we build construction tubes or whatever. And then I started to see way more results on my other side. I was at the gym earlier, getting more sleep. And then eventually I was able to get into the WC, WC, the UFC. And that's when I was okay. When I fought my, world, my first world title fight, I was okay, I'm done. Like I'm not gonna work anymore. Now I'm just gonna keep on doing that. But I think at the beginning of the time, me front loading everything, trying to get my eggs in a basket to see what I really wanted to do got me to that point where I was okay, this is what I want to do. It's, it's going to be fighting. Whether I make it professionally or not, it's going to be that. So how can we make sure we can get to the gym on time, get enough sleep, get all that stuff to do that. And like you said, that's good fuck how you feel, right? I tell my friends all the time, man, I can't, man, I'm, I'm broke. Da, da, da. Go get a fucking job. Go get a job. But it's my passion to be a professional fighter. And you still need a fucking job because, you know, you being a professional fighter doesn't mean you can pay your bills. You still need to get a job. That way you can be able to make ends meet. So, uh, but yeah, I think the front, front loading everything, working extremely hard for those results and not having, it doesn't matter. You know, I remember my coach said this. It was me, Tim Boach, I think Matt Brown, and another athlete. And he said, how are you guys feeling today? And one person was, oh, my back, all oh, this, oh, blah, blah. He goes, okay. I want you guys to know, when I ask you that, I don't give a f how you feel. I'm asking you, do you want to make some fucking money? Because that's what we fight for. We fight for money. And I was like, that's right. Let's make some money. So I think front loading it, and like you said, your, your emotions have to be in check because your short term emotions will affect your long term, your long -term goals if you let it affect your, your decision making, right? And I think for me, there's a lot of times going through that, that, that grind where it's like, man, this is, this is pretty bad. But at the same time, I was like, well, what do you want? What's your end game? What's your, what's your end game goal? I was living on my coach's uh, living room on a mattress. You know, I ended up like just bouncing at a bar. I'd been a cop, I quit my job. And Derek Moneybird presents 10 Commandments of Wealth. Took, took the gamble on myself to become a successful uh, professional fighter and make it to the UFC or pride in that time. And am I making a sacrifice right now or am I just in investing in a better future? And so it's easier for me to do those, to make those decisions when I think about it is like, oh. Yeah, absolutely. I, and, I, and now that you mentioned it, that having to actually really process and think about it, I think that word sacrifice is kind of like, I believe it's the word that the ones at the top kind of use to make everyone else feel better about it. Because when you're at the top, now you realize that that was an investment. Was everything just golden and easy and handed to you, or do you have a little struggle with yourself along the way? No. Yeah, within, uh, in 2013 and 2015, I was living out of my car, you know, full time, and I was too proud to ask for help. Like, how ridiculous is that? You're living out of your car and think you know it all. And 2015, that's when I kind of hit, I knew that I didn't know it all. 
So why not find experts in that and really shortcut that? I thought I was going to just chip away. I thought I was just going to read books till I was an expert. Mm -hmm. I never really talked to anyone that actually did it. So it's been about a week since I've joined the 10 Commandments of Wealth program and there's so many interviews that are offered in this program. I'm inside the Derek Moneybird 10 Commandments of Wealth program. This is an awesome program that you're gonna love. I'm gonna use the principles and the knowledge from this program to help me boost my leads in my marketing firm. Buy this program, it's a wonderful investment for your future. You won't regret it and you'll absolutely love it.